get us started. Um, David Russell, uh, our chief technology officer, uh, is the next presenter um, and on our agenda here. It shows that he's going to be talking about the term data fabric and how that may relate to you and your role in the analytics world. With that, David, uh, I see you just started sharing, so take it away, David. Thank you, Don. So, you know, some of you may have heard the term data fabric. Uh, some of you may not have. Uh, so, but we're going to be talking about what that really means. You may hear more about data fabric over time uh, as it's become uh, sort of the next uh, wave of, you know, analyst discussion within the data management and the data world. So, those of you that have that are dealing with Cognos Analytics or even planning analytics on a regular basis may start to hear more about this over time. Uh, and so we'll try to give you sort of a history of how we got here and some idea of a better definition of what a data fabric is, uh, and then talk about sort of IBM's position specifically uh, with, with data fabric and on a data fabric. So we're going to get started here with, you know, why do we need a data fabric? How do we get here? Uh, then we'll talk about a, a definition of what we really mean by data fabric. That may seem a little backwards, but hopefully you'll get some context when we start talking about the, the why uh, so that we can define the what a little bit better. And then we're going to talk about, you know, IBM's data fabric solution. We'll mention a customer success story with the data fabric tool. Uh, from IBM, and then we'll talk a little bit more about how you can work with LPA and how we can get you started uh, with data fabric. So, starting on the why, you know, it's all about, you know, why might we be looking at something new when it comes to data management? Um, so, when we look at this chart, we sort of get the sense and the idea that, you know, we've been dealing with data for a long time. We, you know, when computers first started, you know, it was hard to store data and, you know, your data volumes were fairly small, but over time you started to see the development of transactional databases uh, and those were, you know, as uh, storage and compute became cheaper, uh, we saw a lot of advantage from storing data and being able to then analyze that data that you'd stored. And so we needed to find a way to manage that data and to make it easier to work with. And so you started to see SQL develop and the relational databases develop and with those enhancements you saw people start to succeed uh, in their ability to analyze and make use of the data that they were collecting throughout their business um, over time though people started to realize there was some limitation uh, around what they could do uh, in analyzing that data directly with the systems that were recording that those transactions you have everything from just the organization of the data isn't very efficient uh, for answering specific questions, particularly analytic questions that are broader than, you know, the transactional systems are really working for. And then you also have the issue of just performance, right? Particularly at the time uh, that you we were starting to see those transactional databases develop, a lot of those systems couldn't handle a lot of volume to answer these larger analytic questions to do serious uh, analysis of the, that data. So we started to see the advent of the data warehouse so that you were you know, in one case, offloading uh, the analysis of that data to a different system, uh, which allowed you to put more hardware and more resources behind those analytic queries that you're doing. Um, and it also allowed you to organize the data in a manner that made it easier to do those analytic queries and to be able to ask, answer certain questions that you might have and common questions that you would have about the data. Um, but there again, we've gotten to the point where there's some limitations to that data warehousing concept. And so you saw people start to deal with the fact that, well, okay, fine, I've got a data warehouse that answers specific questions, but there's a bottleneck now. If I want to answer, ask a new question or uh, incorporate new data that I haven't looked at before, uh, do I have to wait to incorporate that into the data warehouse and understand how to incorporate that into the data warehouse before I can take advantage of that data? So that bottleneck, you started to see people looking for ways to get around that. And so that sort of led to the advent of data lakes, where the promise of uh, expanded storage 
and expanded compute resources with Hadoop or Spark or other capabilities in the big data realm gave us an opportunity to try to store everything uh, with the data lake. So the idea of schema last, if you will, so that you didn't have to worry about how it fit in with your data structures in order to put it into the data lake. You can put the data in the data lake and then uh, worry about how to incorporate it with other data on the way out. So as you were querying it. So that gave more flexibility for self-service, more flexibility for people to be able to ask questions that hadn't been asked before and reduce some of those um, bottlenecks in the data environment by allowing you to provide quick access to data through the data lake and take advantage of those new advances in you know, the big data environments. But as we continue to move on, you know, one of the things that both data warehouses and data lakes tried to deal with and the, one of the promises that they had was they would eliminate data silos and that those data silos would go away because you would have a data warehouse or a data lake where you would centralize all of that data and make it available to everyone through that centralization of your storage and bringing all of that data together. But that really becomes impractical uh, for a number of different reasons. You know, centralizing the data and moving that data can be expensive, particularly when you're talking about a hybrid cloud or multi-cloud environment um, and you have data egress uh, costs associated with that. Uh, you start to wonder about you know, moving data around all the time. Um, and you also have you know, other questions with the data warehouses and data lakes around you know, the, the silo management. You know, in some cases, those silos are there for a reason. Uh, either there's a need to have tighter governance or tighter control over that data. And so that you know, actually creates an issue for trying to copy that data and move it out of that silo. Um, and so we need other ways to access that data to respect some of that, uh, those aspects of the siloed data and to recognize that they're really not going to go away, um, but that what we can do is try to come up with a way to um, not necessarily eliminate the silos so much as work with them or work around them in some fashion. You know, in some cases, you know, you would say that that's similar to data lake and data warehouses, but it's really, you know, taking new, uh, a new look at how to manage that and how to do that. And you know, all of this comes from the fact that you know, data is everywhere in your hybrid and multi-cloud world. And you have this central set of systems that you have that are your systems of record. Uh, and those are you know, frequently these data warehouses or you know, Hadoop, Snowflake, uh, DB2 Warehouse, uh, Amazon Redshift, where you've put your data that is your source of the truth, if you will, and then you have your systems that are collecting that data that may be cloud systems or on-premise systems there on the left and then on the right you have these data consumers that have these different tools from Cognos Analytics to Watson tools to Altrix to uh, what have you and all of those different systems need to be able to communicate and you know to are used to analyze the data uh, the problem is this starts to get a little bit messy uh, you start having people pulling data from everywhere with their end systems. You don't have a consistent view of that data. You're not necessarily governing that access, you know, and you start having people that are repeating efforts, right? In those end tools, each person is doing something different, which really makes a lot of that inefficient in your data management. And, you know, even in this environment, we have statistics that say that, you know, 60 to 73% of data goes unused um, and it's not just that you're not able to make sense of it but you're not even using it right um, and that piecemeal approach that we saw on the right of the different tools the different disparate tools that people are using for analysis you know create this tiered environment of knowledge and that piecemeal approach can be really tough you know we see we've seen over time this exponential growth, whether we're talking about Moore's law or Metcalf's law, you know, Moore's law talking about the growth of compute power, Metcalf's law talking about networking and connectivity uh, and the growth there, you know, those together, you know, sort of lead to this growth, ex exponential growth of available data. Uh, but one of the problems that we have is that the growth of our ability to use that data continues to be rather slow and, and ponderous. And so we're creating this bigger and bigger gap between the knowledge that we're able to obtain 
from the data that we have and then the actual data that's available to us. And that gap is what we really want to try to close, right? We're all, you know, whether we're using Cognos Analytics or we're using some sort of data warehouse or a data lake, you know, it's all about trying to reduce that gap and take advantage of the data and to gain the knowledge that we can from the data that, that's available to us. But the reality is, you know, in this environment where we have, you know, data everywhere uh, and that we need to leverage data that are located in different environments, that we have different types of data in them, we have different data structures, we have different data platforms that we're using, um, you know, we really get into this situation with the hybrid or multi-cloud environment where it becomes more and more difficult for us to pull that data together. And, but, flip side of that is, as Chris mentioned in his talk about, you know, people are expecting answers right now. You know, everybody wants a way to connect the right data at the right time to the right people from anywhere at any time. Uh, and that really is, you know, what we're up against when it comes to, you know, trying to deal with data warehouses and data lakes and you see different techniques being used piecemeal to try to solve this problem. So, this is where we come in with data fabric. So, you know, what is a data fabric? So, a little bit different than data warehouse or uh, data lake in some ways in the sense that a data fabric is more of an emerging design concept for data management that simplifies and addresses the challenges of data complexity. You know, the idea is that you want to provide the enterprise with an agile data foundation to support a wide variety of business cases, and it aligns well with the concept of data ops as well as your initiatives for data modernization and digital innovation in general. You know, Gartner defines data fabric a little in a much wordier fashion. You know, it talks about a data fabric as an emerging data management design concept for obtaining flexible, reusable, and augmented data integration pipelines, services, and semantics in support of various operational and analytic use cases, and it goes on. Uh, and, but it really is, you know, talking about that data management design concept. Forrester talks about it as dynamically orchestrating disparate data sources intelligently and securely in a self-service manner and leveraging various data platforms to deliver integrated and trusted data. But in the end, it's all about how do we bring that data together? And, you know, the data fabric concept, you can think of it as a tapestry that sort of lays over your data estate and the different sources of data and conforms to them to make it easier for people to access the data where it lives to try to reduce data movement and to intelligently make decisions about how to deal with that. It talks, you know, it deals with automation of data integration, data governance, and data processing to provide you tools and mechanisms uh, to make it easier uh, for you to do the data of managing, or do the work of managing the data uh, and hopefully with less uh, less work <laughs> on the back end when you're the one who's consuming that data and looking for that data, finding that data, and making use of that data throughout the organization. So there are really you know, five essential components that we see with a data fabric. The first and really the most important is this idea of self-service, the idea that we need to make it easier for people to find, collaborate, and use data sets uh, throughout uh, the organization. And that usage of the data set could be for immediate analysis and consumption by an individual, or it could be self-service to find data that you want to then incorporate into an application that you're developing so that you have access to the right data from the right location and from a centralized location that the data fabric makes available to you so that you can access that anywhere and, and from any uh, any application or, or even for your own analysis in Cognos or some other tool. Um, second piece is this idea of an augmented knowledge. We want to have a unified view of the data and the metadata. So this is all about understanding the meaning of the data and understanding where it comes from, how it's used, how it's been used. So this is all about the cataloging component and augmenting the, the catalog of data so that it's easier when people do find it for them to know what it is, what it means, and being able to make sure that you are also 
dealing with governance from the concept of having that augmented knowledge of the data linked to data policies and rules for how you protect, protect data and govern access to data so that you make sure that people that shouldn't see social security numbers, for example, can't see social security numbers. Um, so that's you know sort of the next piece. The third element is this smart integration um, because all of this starts with data. And we need to be able to incorporate data from wherever it lives. We need to be able to incorporate it intelligently and we need to have systems and you know different uh, integration styles so that we can extract, ingest, stream, virtualize, transform data, or do whatever we need to with the data to have it be a first class citizen in this data fabric so that it can be accessed and you know and used. And those are the three primary and anchoring components. But then we have two others that sit there and you know I've talked a little bit about the multimodal data governance security and compliance. So you know the augmented knowledge gives you the information about the data and the metadata that describes the data so that you can apply these data governance and security components no matter where you are, whether from a self-service perspective, I'm searching for data, it allows me to see the data that I should be able to see and not see the data that I shouldn't be able to see based on data policies and rules that are driven by that augmented data and metadata, uh, as well as on the integration with data sources so that if I integrate that data together and then serve it out again, that those policies are still applied regardless of how I'm consuming that data. The last bit is a unified life cycle. We want to make sure that we have an environment where we can build, test, and deploy, and manage all aspects of the data fabric. So whether that's building, testing, and deploying your integrations that you're creating for data to make that data available to other users, or whether that is in an AI uh, model operational sense where you have a unified life cycle and a tool to build, deploy, and manage those AI models that you may build on top of the data fabric. So what's IBM's answer to the data fabric? What's the solution that they have there? And it centers around Cloud Pack for Data. Uh, and you may have seen us present previously on Cloud Pack for Data and talk about the AI ladder. That still is a central component of Cloud Pack for Data. You wanna be able to collect the data, but you'll also see similarities, data fabric, when we start talking about it this way and that we were going to collect the data, we want to organize the data, we want to then analyze the data, and then we want to infuse AI into everything that you do. Um, and the components of Cloud Pack for Data that we talk about, you know, auto catalog, auto SQL, auto privacy, and auto AI, you certainly see with auto catalog, the augmented knowledge and the governance there, along with auto privacy, plays into that governance piece. Um, the catalog, auto catalog also allows for the self-service access that you need. And then the auto SQL components really provides that layer for uh, intelligent integration uh, and the smart in integration. And then when you incorporate auto AI with all of those other pieces and the way they all work together, you begin to unlock this capability for managing the life cycle uh, of whatever you're doing. Uh, whether, and that auto AI extends to the ML components that you may want. You know, it allows you to you know, deliver a trusted and business ready data to people wherever they are. Uh, you, and it allows you to use capabilities to unify your data across uh, any of these sources, right? And it isn't about, data fabrics aren't about eliminating data lakes and data, data warehouses as you see here below. They just become part of this data fabric themselves. They become a part of that and a component to what you're doing. You want to make them more accessible and more useful to people by providing the governance and cataloging on top of them to make them to allow for self-service that may have been difficult in the past. Uh, for, for, you know, for those of us that have been working with Cognos for a while, you know, Cognos is the way we make that data searchable through data modules. Uh, but for data science users that are outside of Cognos, it may be harder. And so having this sort of catalog can be an advantage or even for application developers who aren't necessarily in Cognos, they wanna know where the data is, where to find it. You know, they can take advantage of the data lakes and data warehouses more directly by having this catalog available to them. 
So just to give you an idea, sort of an example of how this works, you know, in this case, we'll look at sort of a in action, how this might work for us. You know, the starting point in this case is that we have data in three different data sources. We have an Amazon S3 environment where we have a few uh, applications that may be mobile applications feeding data into the S3. We have a DB2 warehouse and Snowflake that are have aggregated data that we want to have, have available to us or may be involved with this application. Um, first step that we have is we can use an intelligent data catalog, uh, particularly with Watson Knowledge Catalog specifically within Cloud Factor data, to catalog the data across all of those uh, remote environments so that we have a single consistent knowledge graph of linked information that spans all of that data and makes that more easily found. Um, as a data steward is looking at that data in Watson Knowledge Catalog and understanding, you know, the quality of the data that they have, you know, cataloged, they, they also have a responsibility to maintain the privacy uh, of the data. And so that means that they need a way through, and they can use Cloud Factor data again to implement policies to drive those privacy rules. Uh, so as the as you catalog the data in these different data sources and you recognize data that should be kept private, those can be marked or identified automatically once you've defined those uh, the data that you're interested in uh, keeping private. Um, and so that auto cataloging and auto privacy, once they've been defined, can both help you to maintain appropriate governance. Now that you've cataloged and set your privacy rules, you can have your data engineers use virtualization to virtually access the data across those different data sources. So they can merge the data in virtual views. They can create other, uh, there are lots of skills and capabilities that can be brought to bear uh, within that service, within that virtual data access to make it appear to end users as though all of that data resides in a single database and they don't have to worry about the fact that it spans those three different or three different environments. And then finally, you have end users that can have real time access to the data and access it from where it lives rather than necessarily having to wait for other uh, for loads or for people to go find that data for them. And they can develop, you know, on the data science side, they can use auto AI to be developing new machine learning models on top of that data that's cataloged. And one of the big advantages of Cloud Pack for Data is that it can be deployed anywhere. You have a variety of choices in how you would deploy it. Everything from the top right where it's fully managed, that's you know, Cloud Pack for Data with these services in IBM's cloud, uh, where you spin up the services and you have no management requirement. You start using them within minutes of having started those services. To on the bottom left, you can go fully managed on your, I mean, completely unmanaged where you are responsible for everything. You can deploy Cloud Pack for Data on your uh, on-premise in your own hardware, bare metal or virtual machines. And then there are a couple of options in between where you can deploy to any cloud that you wish uh, in an infrastructure as a service uh, environment where you simply take your favorite cloud with your favorite VMs and deploy OpenShift and Cloud Pack for Data on top of that and manage that environment. Uh, or you have the option in most clouds to have a managed OpenShift environment so that you simply install Cloud Pack from there. But that gives you a lot of flexibility both on where your workloads run and your comfort in management of the environment uh, and give you a lot, gives you lots of options for taking advantage of these capabilities to build your own data fabric. So just talk about a specific um, success story from IBM, you know, with ING, most of us have heard of them. They're a large complex bank with a mix of disparate data silos with both legacy and modern capabilities. They, had a, they have to adhere to a number of industry regulatory requirements, and that really makes accessing and querying data difficult and complex within their organization. Um, and they frequently see their data insight initiatives slowed or delayed uh, because of those uh, bottlenecks around being able to access and query data. So their goal was to move to a single corporate operating model, uh, and they wanted to be able to deal with 
a lot of the cross-border regulatory environment that is coming into play, whether that's GDPR or other regulation. Um, sorry, I'm ahead there. Um, in the end, ING partnered with IBM to streamline their data management and their, and their applications across all of their operational countries. Uh, and they developed a single model strategy and, and they leveraged the platform, the IBM Cloud Factor Data platform, including IBM data virtualization, Watson Knowledge Catalog, and Data Stage, uh, so that they could ensure that they had proper governance and they could leverage data from anywhere in the bank uh, using those capabilities. You know, those are three of those particular three that I mentioned are three of the primary components of the data fabrics within Cloud Pack for data. So with all of that, giving you hopefully giving you a better idea of what a data fabric is and why people, why you might hear about it more uh, in the coming months to years uh, as we start hearing from analysts about that. Um, but you know really wanted to answer for you also, how can LPA continue to help you learn more about this, right? And we have a number of options for how you can look to us to help, you know, one, if you're sold on the idea of a you know, data fabric and you just want to get started with Cloud Pack for Data, we can certainly help you with that. We can get the right resources involved uh, to have you set up your own Cloud Pack environment, start working with it, start seeing what, uh, what it can do. Um, and we can, uh, you know, help you through that journey. Um, on a broader, you know, from a broader perspective, we can also help you with a data modernization workshop. This is a fairly short, brief engagement where we work with you to sort of understand the endpoints of your data roadmap of where you want to go. So we can help you understand where you are with your data management uh, operations and how you're doing today and talk about then where you want to be and talk about how data fabrics or other technologies would fit into um, helping you along that path. And then uh, in a larger engagement, we could talk to you about a data readiness assessment. And this would involve, you know, looking at your data and helping you to understand whether you're ready for that next step. This is a deeper dive into, you know, specifics of people, process, technology, data, and helping to understand where you are at a deeper level and understanding, you know, what tools and technologies may help you moving forward, or even just what are the uh, initiatives that you should consider with what you have today uh, to better analyze your data, better manage your data, and make better use uh, of the things that you have uh, in your arsenal today uh, and help you there. So hopefully that's been helpful. Hopefully you've got a better sense of what's going on with the data fabric term. And uh, Don, I'll turn it over to you. Sure, um, and, and really, one question, though, though it is fairly technical, um, and it was around data virtualization um, and how data virtualization deals with latency and data sharing when working in a hybrid multi-cloud environment. Sure, so, you know, I mentioned data virtualization briefly in there, and, you know, the idea of data, data virtualization is to allow you to pull data from a lot of different sources uh, and combine them as if they're in, in a single database. And in a multi-cloud environment, one of the things that you run into is you have data housed in different clouds and you want to minimize how much data you're moving around. That's the whole point to leaving it in place. So data virtualization allows you to run agents where those agents are, can be placed close to the data that is being queried and the data virtualization engine creates a constellation of agents and it is uses AI and other te techniques to um, decide where queries should run and how they should run to pull the data together uh, most efficiently. And so part of that is deciding, you know, if I have data that resides in a AWS cloud, I may have an agent running in AWS where a query is executed there on that agent the data is minimized, right? You've done all your filtering, you've done your processing of that data uh, there in AWS, and then that gets moved back to the central data virtualization environment to then be combined with whatever other data is being queried. So we, you know, the whole point is you're using a distributed uh, optimization engine uh, within your data virtualization to try to minimize the movement and try to take best advantage of the resources that are out there. 
Uh, so there's more to it. There's a lot more details that you need to do from an architectural perspective, but just giving it. David, perfect. Thanks. And and that's uh, that's great for now. And as as with all of our presenters, David's very accessible to our, uh, our clients and and folks that are looking to become clients and uh, happy to set up time to talk about the term data fabric and how we could help.